jump straight in. So the first order of the day is a bit of an overview on the markets. Uh, as Bitcoin is currently sitting at 60.3K, Ethereum 2.9K, and Solana 124. I have my CoinGecko page open at the same time, and it's it's hurting bad, right? It is very, very red. Um, and yesterday, for the audience listening, we discussed that just over a week ago, BTC went through its fourth halving, which is obviously an incredible milestone, uh, where the block rewards was divided by two for the miners. And since then, the price has experienced tons of volatility. It actually dropped to under 60K one week ago before jumping back to 65K last weekend. And since then, it's been a steady decrease. Uh, but the Crypto Fear and Greed Index is still pretty high at 67. So I would like to hear it from the panel. I know we don't have a crystal ball here, don't get me wrong. But where do you think the market is heading? Are you still bullish on the next couple of weeks? Or do you think we're still aiming for a, for a correction? Uh, Rock, please go ahead, my deep voice friend. Actually, you'll have to give me a second. I'm, I'm, I'm frantically trying to buy the dip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I, I don't think anything has changed. Um, ultra bullish. Uh, I don't know about short term. I never really try to predict short or medium term. Could we be up or down in the next weeks or months? I have no idea. Um, but ultra bullish on, on the space in general. Everything's going according to plan. And the turmoil uh, around the world is uh, just Bitcoin and crypto rocket fuel. Uh, the fact that the U.S. is continuing and even stronger than ever to weaponize the dollar. Uh, sanctioning, I don't know what it's up to like. 20 or 30 countries now. I mean, if you tell everyone they can't use the dollar, I mean, you're telling them not to use the dollar. So they're going to use something else. And my prediction that I've been saying now for years, but I'm getting much more vocal about recently is that while these BRICS nations are trying to uh, find a way to circumvent the dollar or trade in their own currencies or make, they recently announced, actually, we were on an executive call for one of my teams uh, for Lunar Digital Assets. And uh, I said in the morning, uh, I really think this is going to happen in the next maybe 12 to 24 months that BRICS will switch to Bitcoin. Later that day, they announced that they would be using some kind of blockchain technology. I think they're, what's going to happen is they're going to explore that. They're going to maybe do some trials, maybe maybe even launch a real uh, like blockchain currency between all the BRICS nations. But the problem is these are not really friendly nations. You know, India and China, for example, have had land skirmishes, almost like, you know, land wars for for a long time now, over a decade. And uh, it seems unlikely that they'll be able to find a monetary policy together. And all of these different countries are very different countries. They're not actually friends. They're only united against the U.S. dollar. So they won't be able to find a way to play together. It'll be very difficult. It'll be much different than like the Euro zone uniting. These are very different countries with very different ideologies and what they're going to do. And I, I'm, I'd, I'd give this a 90% probability in the next, say, four years is they're going to use Bitcoin uh, as, their, as their neutral currency of, uh, you know, the money of friends and enemies. Wow, that's actually a very bullish statement. I love this uh, geopolitical analysis. Irina, do you actually relate to, to what Rob just said? Um, geopolitics is, uh, is definitely one of the topics of discussion with Sanction and BRICS recently announcing launching its currency. But what I believe we should be focusing on is actually the super cycle we're in and everything that's being built on the blockchain and hence Polkadot ecosystem exists as we are building lots of exciting things. So it's not just Bitcoin, like the always the narrative the uh, of the bull market, it begins with the Bitcoin. But I have been in Polkadot ecosystem for the last four years. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. I'm also recently from Dubai. <laughs> I came back from Dubai. So we're, we're all in... A, uh, in this voice situation. And everybody got sick in Dubai. I, I just heard of uh, a couple people who had to get antibiotics. I'm actually probably going to go to the doctor today because I have to fly in a couple days and I uh, and my cold is only getting worse. I don't know what happened in Dubai, the crazy flooding, maybe changes in uh, weather or temperatures, who knows. Tell me about it, man. I was there as well. 
Yeah, quite, also quite a bit of uh, of talking and conferences. Um, but yeah, going back to the to the topic of our discussion, what excites me is that we are building communities uh, in Pokrat. Now we have <clears throat> over one point five, approximately one point five million uh, wallets dot holders, and this makes us the largest decision making group in the world. This is an unparalleled governance mechanism that can be compared with how we govern our cities how we uh, govern our countries how we you know um, structure the entire governance and voting process and decision making process and this experiment this sandbox is um, practically available to everybody anyone can get a little bit of dot um, open an account GS participate in open governance, participate in discussions, cast their vote, and decide on the future what can be funded, what can be built, what are the important things to, you know, bring into the real world from the blockchain space, uh, or what is the tooling, the the tools, the infrastructure that needs to be built in the blockchain space to make it even more robust, resilient, user friendly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm very bullish and excited about the things that people are building nowadays and this been going on throughout the bear market because um, builders know that things don't stop. We don't pay attention to prices. Yes, it's, you know, it, liquidity goes down. Uh, there's less funding available for some marketing and business development initiatives, but builders keep building and they come up with innovation and the most exciting news for me that just recently uh, was announced in Dubai's jam by Dr. Gavin Wood. Uh, it's, it's a complete revolution of what can be achieved in terms of scalability and security of blockchains and this is what I'm the most excited about uh, in, in the coming you know, years, because we are here uh, for the very long run. And as I mentioned, I truly think we are already in a super cycle. So nothing I is going to be to zero. I see where this is coming from. And uh, I actually agree we shouldn't be focusing only on BTC. But the reason why I asked the question about BTC is because it is an important, I would say, a very relevant metric to understand what's happening in the whole crypto industry at the end of the day if bitcoin wins i think the whole industry wins by extension and we have 80 who joined us can you hear me 80 how are you man you're muted bottom left corner hey how's it going guys yeah i joined a little late um not sure what we're talking about but how's everyone doing yeah, we're good, my friend. We're good. No worries at all. We're talking about BTC price falling or just just above sixty k. So it's been a it's been a steady decrease since uh, the BTC halving. Sure. Serena, I mean, markets go up and down. I mean, uh, you know, it's nothing new. It's uh, pretty standard for crypto volatility. Yeah. I don't even think it's really that bad. It's uh, it is what it is. You know, like. <laughs> I, not much to think about. I agree, man, and it might be a bit of a controversial take, but I actually, I am actually more focused when the market is slightly dipping because when it's pumping, we all feel we all feel super excited and overwhelmed, and uh, it prevents me from focusing on my work. But anyway, you know what? Let's uh, uh, enough of this uh, BTC crystal ball. I want to jump on the next order of business, which is about token unlocks. Now this is going to be super super interesting because I'm not sure if you guys uh, if you guys are familiar with the website called Token Unlocks, but there is tons of unlocks happening in there. Hold on, um, the binary holdings, my friend. Do you mind muting yourself here? Thank you, buddy. Thank you. So <laughs> no worries, man. No worries at all. So the website Token Unlocks, which I heavily recommend. They, they mentioned that there is significant unlocks happening in May, which includes DYDX, Athena, Sui, Aptos, Peace Network, Starknet, Arbitrum, Avalanche, Optimism, and many more. Uh, you have certainly noticed, by the way, there are a lot of blockchains included in this list. And the unlock value is over 3.6 billion US dollars. I'm not sure if you guys remember this, actually, on, but on February... Starknets, they 
announced a change to the initial token NMOC plan for early contributors and investors. It was actually a huge drama on Twitter because early contributors were supposed to have a cliff of two or three years, if I remember correctly. But here is the twist. This, they, started, they started the count not at the token launch, but years ago. So effectively, the unlock was supposed to happen right now. So they had to backtrack. So I'm very cu curious to hear everyone's opinion on this. Um, like, do you think the market can sustain so much unlocks, like 3.6 billion in one month? What's your take on this, Rock? I mean, this sounds uh, like many things we, we've heard. I mean, we've heard this from, you know, uh, the Mount Gox Trust, right? They're going to sell a bunch and it's going to be doom and gloom and Solana unlocks. And I mean, generally, the, I, I bet if you go back at any three month or six month period in the history of crypto, there's probably a similar amount of stuff being unlocked. I, I think, I mean, you, you named just a few, but I mean, probably there's, there's probably two or 3000 projects having unlocks in that time period. So I don't think that that's uncommon. Um, not so worried about that. I am curious though about the, um, about the, um, uh, uh, Starknet you mentioned. Uh, so was this done through a vote or did they unilaterally change these? I, I know everybody was pissed off about this, but was this done? Like to me, I think if there's going to be changes to tokenomics, then the, the, the kind of, I don't want to call them shareholders for <laughs> security reasons, but the the holders of the tokens should have a say in that. If the token holders have a say in it and there's a vote, then I think that's kosher. If not, then I think that that's uh, an overstep by the project and people should kind of shame them for that. Yeah, no, I don't think it was a vote, but for, act for actually a simple reason is the fact that they were actually increasing their cliff by a, by a significant amount. So when you're going harder on the investors and the, the early contributors, usually the community is, is kind of happy about it. I call this damage control, but uh, yeah, this, this is what happened. Yeah, it's a fair point. I mean, with Doge Chain, which, which is an L2 of Doge, um, there was a lot of outstanding tokens when the look within the first couple of months of it going live it had it went to like four and a half billion fully diluted but there was only a, a couple or a few percent of the supply was out you know, out in circulation and so the community voted to burn 80 percent of the supply uh and that included their own airdrop tokens that included team tokens and so i thought that was an interesting way to do it that the community voted but otherwise any unilateral moves that change uh, vesting that was agreed upon previously that's that's not that's no good to me yeah, and that's that's actually a very philosophical conversation. Like, how do you want to align the project interest and the community interest, the holders' interest? They're not necessarily aligned here. AD, what do you think? Like, what's your take on this next wave of unlocks that is going to happen in the next month? Do you think, like Rock, that it's actually nothing unusual that it happened plenty of time in the past, and that the market can naturally sustain it? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, like, the the reality is, is that whenever you have price appreciate with, you know, the kind of velocity that we've seen recently, very similar to, uh, I think back to uh, 2021, like March, April, like, it's very similar, you know, where we had just kind of a steady run up that was uh, with a lot of velocity, a lot of imaginary money gets created in that time frame in a very short amount of time frame typically these situations unravel with what you were seeing right now which is a liquidity crunch right it doesn't matter what the reasons are every time we see some movement like this there's different narratives right it, it, there's a war too much uh you know paper money got printed whatever it, it doesn't matter the reasons it's just a simple matter of when numbers go up too fast, too quickly, you know, money just grows on trees everywhere. Unfortunately, once people start picking at that tree, it, uh, it dries up real quick. You know, that's just the reality of the math of it, you know? So um, I, I don't think the unlocks add any extra pressure to the markets. They're trivial at the end of the day. 
Um, does that mean that we're not going to see more uh, market turmoil? I guess you could call it. I don't even know if it's turmoil when all the markets are up for the year, right? But um, it, it's just it's just that people have this weird sense of perspective when imaginary numbers go up and then they come back down. They they're, they're so focused on this imaginary value that they had and then lost that they forget that. Well, actually, a lot a lot of imaginary value still exists <laughs> from the beginning of the year. You know, it's it's really not that bad. So it's just like it's it's a weird psychology that extreme volatility has. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. You know, like, this is just oh, it's just it is what it is. One second. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm ranting. So oh, I was. Um, I, no, no worries. I was. Uh, my connection. I was switching off of uh, Wi-Fi so I could go for a walk, get some sun, clear this cold. But um, yeah, I I fully agree. I think whenever the market goes down, people are looking for some reason. Why did it go down? Why did it go down? I mean, it's, when I, like, you know, I have lots of friends that I've evangelized crypto to over the last 10 years, and, you know, they all start DMing me. Oh, what's, what's wrong? Did something change? Is it like, are we still holding? And my answer is the same for 10 years. Yes, we're holding. Don't. We're not selling. So um, it is what it is. This is a small drop. We're only down, I think, what, 17, 20%. Uh, this is very, 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 very normal in crypto. Yeah. I mean, I like I, this is my third full cycle. And I mean, it's this is so kosher. This is so like tame. The And I mean, really, the only the only worry, I guess, I think many one of the reasons this is feeling amplified to some people is that altcoins just haven't performed like people have been hoping. But this really is kind of the year of Bitcoin, you know, ETFs and, and all these things. And I, I mean, I've always kind of told people, make sure you're holding a good amount of your portfolio on Bitcoin. Um, I don't think most people listen to that in Web3, but uh, you have to hold some Bitcoin. A hold some Bitcoin, guys. I think that's a very sane advice. A next order of business, and I say this with a heavy heart, actually, but CZ to be sentenced in the U.S. today for the alleged crimes he committed at Binance. A uh, full context for the audience listening, CZ admitted that Binance processed trillions of dollars in unmonitored transaction and that failing to monitor those transactions violated the Bank Secrecy Act. And he's also admitted that he failed to stop all reports on millions of dollars in illicit transaction that flowed through Binance. The sentence, by the way, is expected to be between zero and three years in prison. Um, so I know this has been discussed already at length, but I want to open this conversation again. Do you think the treatment for CZ is fair here, or is he paying for being number one? Uh, what three philosopher you just joined us? How are you, man? Can you hear me? Hey, guys. Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Thanks for having me. No, of course. So what do you think of CZ here, like, do you think he's treated unfairly? I'm um, sorry, say again. Uh, what do you think of CZ treatment? He's being sentenced, like he's being trialed today. Yeah, honestly, I, I have no words um, except what I can recall from the uh, leaked documents and where he you know, admitted to committing crimes. I would say he got off on, you know, pretty easy because the sentence for this sort of crimes, I think carries around 18 to 24 months in the U S but, uh, looks like his uh, letter to the judge worked out all good. I don't look, I don't, when we say that he committed crimes, there's two layer levels or layers here. One is, uh, these crimes were like these, the laws were unclear and two, are all men, and this is a whole different story and maybe one for another day, but a philosophical question is, are all man's laws just? And I think just because, and I'm in the United States, I'm a proud patriot, and uh, my, my ultimate dream is to go into politics, but I, with all that being said, I don't agree with everything our country does. I think no, no citizen in any country should agree with everything their country does. I also don't see why the United States has such a far reach over the world. People in all countries are kind of shaking in their boots anytime the U.S. might call some SEC action or, or something. Uh, it's I, I don't like the current state of affairs in the world. I don't think the U.S. should be so involved. And I think the U.S. would be better off if they weren't so involved. Um, 
But did CZ commit a bunch of crimes? I don't know all the details, but I think CZ is one of the good guys. Um, I think that he built an incredible business. He didn't lose anyone's money. He didn't scam anyone. Uh, he didn't, I don't think it in any way really committed fraud or anything. It was just a matter of not following United States, not, this is not his own countries, but this is not following United States monitoring laws on a, on a, on currencies that were not even clear to have had monitoring like laws. So, you know, I, again, I don't know the full details, maybe I'm wrong, but I think this is, this is a classic you know, attack the people that are competing with you and crypto competes with the U S dollar. It's no secret. <laughs> Congress people say it all the time that, you know, this is like, you know, a lot of crypto people are their whole, the whole reason crypto is kind of created and, and a lot of the plans of crypto, I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying this is their narrative is the whole reason for crypto is that it's going to take over the dollar and they're very scared of this. And the dollar is at all, you know, basically all time weakness in terms of trade volume around the world. We're down in the last uh, 24 years from 2000, we're down from 70 something, 78% of uh, world trade to 58, I think now. And uh, the US is worried and they're going to try to attack anyone who, who messes with their currency. It's the same thing that's happened in any country that said they don't want to, you know, dollarize or, you know, get into the central bank system or comply with the US. They all become terrorists magically or they all, you know, become child pornographers or money launderers or drug dealers or whatever word they use of the day to attack their, their enemies. Yeah, and all, all things considered, I think between zero and 36 months is in prison is still reasonably, like, not super aggressive towards CZ. I know it's a heavy sentence, but considering how he attacks the US dollar, as, as you said, they could have gone against him very hard. Um, but I think most people, most people assume from what I've read that he's going to be zero months in prison. He's not going to have jail time from the, from people's assumption at this point. Uh, Irina, what, what's your take on this? Like, what's your take on the whole CZ trial? It's very sad to see. Um, CZ, of course, is the prominent figure in the space. He led um, the industry. He's done great business. He created he built a great company, great team, uh, and the jurisdiction, I mean, they, they've tried to settle in many jurisdictions and we live in the reality where uh, law and regulation is still, uh, you know, challenging for our industry and there are many <clears throat> gray areas and there's a lot of work that needs to be done with regulators uh, and it needs to be a constant work and not crypto project um, is ever sure if, you know, the future is secured from the regulators. So it has to be a continuous conversation with them, a continuous um, sort of approval that your, your tokens are utility and not a security and that you are operating within um, the framework that is acceptable by the SEC and uh, uh, similar organizations in uh, other jurisdictions. Um, my take on this is that, you know, um, the world is changing. Um, we are in the crisis of leadership, financial systems, conventional systems that are crumbling down and we need new systems to replace them, uh, new tools, new frameworks. Uh, we live in a world that is interconnected and many people who come into this industry, they seek freedom. They seek freedom of movement, freedom of, um, payments, cross-border payments, younger generations, you know, millennials, Gen Z, we live in an environment where there were no borders. You could move freely, you could settle in any location. Like our parents' generation didn't have this luxury of just, you know, coming to any country, landing a job or working remotely and um, taking the fruits of life uh, and, and, you know, being comfortable in any geography of the world and this is i believe what we are all trying to solve with uh, within the industry to have the freedom to have the legal framework and compliance and uh, the 
ease of use of all these financial tools and replace banking, but also do it in a in a proper way, right? Because in in a legal way, but regulators have to become open and have to um, become flexible to to the new realms and um, change the old order and rules that no longer work for the society and of course there will be a certain level of resistance and CZ is is the leader so he's taking the punch for all of us um, yes he is the history yes, will he is. Know, the history will 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 judge and we'll see in sort of several decades <clears throat> the real the real outcome and the real impact of this but um, I uh, I respect a lot his work and what he's done for the industry and the rest is history. The rest is history, absolutely. We have 10 minutes before we go over the sponsor of today's show. But before this, I do have a couple of topics that I want to discuss. And I want to talk about another legend in this industry. And you all know him. It's Michael Saylor, the boss of MicroStrategy. And uh, they actually recently crossed a significant milestone because they now hold 13.6 billion worth of BTC, 1% of the total circulating supply. Imagine this, 1% of the total circulating supply. Uh, Michael Saylor, he's obviously an absolute legend. He kept buying during the bear market when everybody was criticizing him, calling him names but he's currently sitting at 4.7 billion unrealized profits. Imagine this. And it's actually quite funny because everybody is super hyped about the ETF spot Bitcoin by BlackRock, right? But actually, if you wanted to get exposed to BTC as an institution, you could simply buy micro strategy stocks this whole time. So, you know, BlackRock, they didn't invent anything. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But what do you think, seriously, of um, of micro strategy? Like, is is this guy a madman? What what's what do you think, Rock? Oh, Rock, you're. Uh... Ad, what do you think of Michael Saylor, my friend? Uh, well, I mean, he's quite frankly, probably a genius uh, for what he's done. He saw a very unique, basically arbitrage opportunity to some degree. Um, and MicroStrategy, the stock, is essentially a leveraged Bitcoin position for institutions if they want that kind of product. That's essentially what it is. Um, because they're constantly borrowing money at very low rates and just buying more and more Bitcoin. Like that's, that's just their entire business now. So if you want like base, essentially a leveraged institutional Bitcoin product, that's micro strategy stock right there. I think it's even more than that, actually. Uh, that's a, that's a big part of it for sure. And they've shown that they're competent in that in, I mean, it's really, I, I never use leverage, but if I were ever to use leverage, buying micro strategy is a, is a sound, it's a sound form of leverage because of the way that they do it, because they're not just going on, you know, BitMEX and doing like, you know, 5X leverage. They're just going and when they have excess capital, either from their, their, you know, uh, intelligent, uh, business intelligence business, or when they have, uh, when they think their stock has gotten, um, overvalued based on how much you know bitcoin they have or, or whatever um they just dilute buy more bitcoin and the shareholders are happy for it it's a very odd model uh that i don't think we've ever seen in in history which is the shareholders want to be diluted to buy more bitcoin because the bitcoin will make the, their amount of bitcoin that they'll have over time will be stronger and if he gets into a situation let's say we go into a bear market his the the loans he also borrows money against company uh shares as collateral and these like convertible notes and when he does that it's at a very low rates and when he does it it's not uh it's not easily liquidated it's not like he's just going to get liquidated if the price of bitcoin goes down these are like more structured loans and they're often i think like four-year loans so he can survive an entire cycle 
um, before he has to pay those back. And the amount of uh, business revenue he has can cover the interest anyways. And if, if worst came to worst, they just can uh, issue more shares. So there's like very low risk in, in him being liquidated. And what the core model is of it, what the, the beauty of it is and the genius of it is, is that they are buying, they are borrowing an asset that is depreciating and, and depreciating at rates the worst seen in a long time. This is the worst inflation we've seen in decades, right? And so he's using that depreciating borrowing with a depreciating asset, which means when you borrow, not only is the Bitcoin going to go up, but the dollar's value goes down and is easier to pay back later. So he's bar he's borrowing a depreciating asset to buy an appreciating asset. And it's just a, it's kind of a no brainer. And then on top of all of that, people are buying the stock because they believe in him and they want to see him succeed because he's like, you know, Bitcoin giga Chad. I mean, I don't buy Mike. I, I own micro strategy stock. I, I've been meaning to buy a lot more and it's not because, Oh, I, you know, think I'm going to get a good leverage play on my Bitcoin. I don't really care that much about that. It's, you know, most of my Bitcoin has been sitting for 10 years. Uh, it's, it's more that I like this guy. I like what he's doing and I want him to succeed at what he's doing. And uh, in particularly, so other companies follow suit and see that holding Bitcoin on your balance sheet is a good idea and that most companies should start holding at least some portion of their, their, their balance sheet in, in Bitcoin. And then on top of all that, he also is building now Bitcoin infrastructure stuff and trying to become a Bitcoin technology company, which, I mean, it's just a, it's just a great, the guy's a genius, honestly. <laughs> You, you might as well at this point, if you have so, if you have 5 billion of unrealized profit in BTC, you might as well build a BTC infrastructure for your own sake. Um, what three philosopher, what's your philosophy on, on uh, Michael Saylor? What do you think of him? There is no second best. <laughs> Look, I'm a big fan of Michael Saylor. I think that uh, there's very few people uh, in, in the planet entirely, right, who can say that they have conviction in something. You know, I talk to a lot of VCs and a lot of VCs, you find that they don't have any conviction in anything. And that's why they do this spur and pray strategy. And it's always refreshing to see someone um, stand on their beliefs and basically go all in. And, you know, he's ultimate, right. the ultimate conviction. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Like, and I think that's what you need, honestly, if you want to make real changes in the world. And I think that his strategy with Bitcoin, it goes further than money. I think he actually wants to rewrite uh, society in a, in a sense. And I'm here for it, honestly. Awesome. Well, the way he thinks about the world and when you hear him speak, and I must have listened to, I don't know, 500 hours of him speaking by this point. He's... Uh, Cindy, my girlfriend, she uh, she doesn't really like when I listen to things uh, while I'm falling asleep. So uh, sometimes I'll put on a headset because that's how I fall asleep listening to podcasts. But a lot of the time, if I put him on on the TV and we fall asleep, she's okay with it because his voice is kind of soothing and wise sounding. ASMR, ASMR. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> Bitcoin ASMR. But um, yeah, the guy's just philosophy on life, on on his understanding of history his understanding of the the pros and cons of government and the things government has done right and wrong, the, pro, the, the things that different money issuers have done right and wrong. Um, it's just, it's, he's got such a good perspective on history. He's such a history buff. Interesting, man. I listened to one of his podcasts. I actually never did. I've only been following his Bitcoin purchase but there, there might be more to the story. Guys, we have to jump you to the last... You haven't listened to any of his speakings? I actually, I actually, maybe one or two conference, but it was very Bitcoin-centric. Not too much on the, the other stuff you mentioned, but I, I will definitely will. Listen to his Lex Friedman interview. That's a really good Ooh, one. Oh, that's a four-hours-long interview, isn't it? It's a good one. I've listened to it <laughs> a few times. Awesome, man. Okay, let's jump to the last segments one last order one last news that i wanted to touch upon i'll be brief with this one but as a warning to our audience please note that poloniex wrapped bitcoin is depegging uh, poloniex is an exchange that is owned by justin sun that offers wrapped bitcoin product on tron and it's currently trading at more than 20 percent discounts so you can buy bitcoin at 50k right now on their exchange but i wouldn't recommend it there is zero volume over the last 24 hours. Uh, I don't know who's using wow. it. Wow. Yes, What's sir. happening? 
Do you know what's happening with it? I think it's it's a bit unclear, to be honest with you. Um, it's something that I have to follow, but I don't follow Tron too much. I don't know what's happening on Tron. I don't know why people are using Tron, but I get that's the topic for another day. To be monitored closely, situation to be monitored. Um, TBH, the binary holdings, is the sponsor of today. Are you with me, my friend? Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. What's your name, by the way? Sorry, I didn't catch it. My name is Manit. Manit. M-A-N-I-T. Manit. Manit. Yes. Awesome, Manit. Awesome. Welcome to the show. Can you please, as an introduction, share more on uh, what you guys are, have, have built? What is the binary holding in a, a one-minute elevator pitch? The binary holding, guys, is a Web3 infrastructure player or a platform for telcos or telecom companies banking, gaming companies, and similar verticals across where the binary token is going to be used as gas fee. So I wanted to kind of just push it up that we are focusing on being the infrastructure where we kind of build more and more demand, which creates more value for the telecom companies, the banks, and the others. That's who we are. Okay, so I want this to be clear for the audience, if you, could, uh, if you could simplify this for me. So let's say I'm a telecommunication company. Why is your service useful to me? I mean, think about it this way. Um, if I, if I um, had to ask everybody on this uh, space, how many of you guys really use your telco app, your telecommunication application? The answer would be very low, right? So what happens is now, the target base that when you study about it in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, you understand that they're aspirational, it's a combination of aspirational and non-aspirational audiences. And that's when you understand that the products that you're going to explore to them, which is TikTok for sports, where they can engage and earn, where you have learned to earn, where you're talking about move to earn, you create marketplaces where they can earn fan tokens and trade them for the primary tokens and then use that to pay for insurance premium, to pay for postpaid mobile bills, to buy more data packs, to buy electronics within the marketplace, collectibles, that creates value. And that is exactly why the telcos kind of partnered with us and how we saw creating a value for the telcos. So have you already onboarded like telecommunication uh, companies in the Southeast Asia? Yes, we have. So we've already integrated with Indosat Urido Hutchinson, which is a part of the Urido Hutchinson group, which has another 27 telcos or 30 telcos in their vertical. This company is based out of Indonesia, Indosat Urido Hutchinson. We've already integrated with them we have 43 million registered users, 36, 37 odd monthly active users, 3.3 million daily active users, and close to a million unique wallet transactions. That's the story as of today. Good. Thank you for sharing these numbers. This is uh, this is quite good. Uh, sorry, Rock, you wanted to jump in. Please feel free. Yeah. What? So, what is the token used for? So the token used for multiple items, right? I mean, the first thing is uh, payments. So within the ecosystem, because you're a part of telco, you not only pay for uh, insurance premiums, uh, postpaid mobile bill uh, payments, uh, data top-ups. Apart from that, you also use that to redeem as a loyalty point for merchandise, for electronics, and so on across 10 different categories. Then you come in and every time a communication or an API call is done, there's an authentication happening. And that's where the token is further getting used for. And just to add, Rock, since you asked for, right? Um, just to add, another utility that is being worked on right now, which is going to go mainnet by July end, is our uh, L2, layer 2. We are actually launching our own layer 2. Um, which is going to be built on Optimism Superchain. 
and we're going to build our own layer two, and the main net is going to come out in July. So that's where all the companies that have been a part of our ecosystem are going to build on our layer two, plus our dev community through hackathons that we've built are going to build features and build more stuff on our layer two, plus our own platform, which is generating millions and millions of on-chain data. So all that comes on our layer two, and that's where um, our own primary token acts like a gas fee, which further generates more utility. So I think um, as of now, we've identified these. Is this, is this more things. like if you're making a chain? Is this more? Is the token used more B two B, or are you working with the actual consumers? We're working with both. So telco is the B two B. So we partner with the telco. Then the engagement happens with the consumers. That's B two C. So when you work with both, so on one end the enterprise is connecting with our API, connecting their wallet to our system, and accessing our platform for better understanding of the user behavior, better price optimization. And on the other hand, the consumer is engaging with the platform, engaging with the content, and earning tokens, and using them as a payment methodology for. Data top-ups for insurance premium for other services within the telco ecosystem. So it's a combination of both. Thank you for sharing, man. And uh, I, I wanted, I was curious a bit because we started this uh, this show by saying, okay, you guys are listed now on MXC. So your token is tradable for the average user. They might want to buy your token. What's the upside for people buying into your token? If it's used as a gas fee in your ecosystem, how do you see this accruing value in the future? Oh, so you know, very interesting question, actually. Uh, now, see, I am a very, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a great zookeeper for my company. I, when, when I mean, what I mean by that is, I'm a great CEO. And okay. when I say that, when I say that, it's because when we think about, you know, you just spoke about gas fees. Just think about it. Now, if I talk about numbers, we plan to have a billion odd tokens out there in the market by, I don't know, uh, 40, within the next 14 months, right? We, of course, are looking at multiple utility value. And of that billion, majority of it is being consumed within the ecosystem that we are building. So what I mean by that is we are building our own infrastructure. We have common BUs which plug into our ecosystem. So we have digital social, which is a part of engage to earn, move to earn, learn to earn, and everything on those sides. Then we have digital finance, which is trade fi, DeFi. And we are building some solid nuggets out there. Then we have enterprise. On the enterprise, we are focusing on real-world asset, digital twin, medtech. Then we have our own incubator, accelerator, where we, are, where we are actually buying stakes in multiple companies. And then the network, which is the layer that we are building. When you plug that in the middle and you have all these multiple BUs underneath it, then you are creating a single funnel into the telecom sector, banking, e-wallets, gaming, and which and any other vertical. What that does, it creates more utility. So gas fees become one of the utilities, but it creates more utility because now your token is being consumed within your ecosystem instead of fiat for doing transactions, for buying items, for trading things. And that's what's the beauty of the binary holdings ecosystem. Okay. Well, you sound you sound passionate about it, which is uh, which is uh, nice to hear. Um, I actually wanted to ask a little bit on the background of your project. For how long have you been live? How big is your team? Did you receive any funding? Because at the end of the day, you're trying to disrupt the telecommunication industry, which is very ancient. No, not very ancient. I'm I'm pushing it, but I mean compared to Web three. This is, a, let's say, an old one. Uh, first question. Uh, in the Web3, a lot of people have tried uh, getting onto telecoms, but unfortunately, they haven't succeeded as much. We've cracked the model. We have today 
I mean, I just spoke about one telco that we've integrated with. We are currently integrating with two more telcos, and we have seven other agreements which are signed up. Southeast Asia, South Asia, parts of Middle East and Africa are are starting to go into are are going to become our fortresses because you got to understand what we've done. We are focusing on emerging markets. and under developed markets when we talk about crypto there are probably 300 odd million users 30 odd million active users we're talking about competing with a 5 billion dollar industry a sorry a 5 billion people industry which is swift network traditional fiat you want to compete you got to grow Do you, you know key, get to, do you know how to how to size the telecom market industry? That's super interesting. Now, how big is this? The this telecom market, okay. So, Indosat Urido is 100 million subscribers, 43 million, sorry, 40 million on their application, and 36 we've converted as monthly active users, right? And now, if you talk about it, they are a part of Urido Hutchinson. They have twenty eight other telcos under their wings. This is their biggest project because Indosat Orido is the biggest telecom within the Orido Hutchinson. We've been working with for, for with them for five months. We have use cases that we've got it approved. We're going to publish it out. Once that is done, we get all the telcos in their space. So we don't have to go and do a business development with them. It follows on. That means the consumer base from Web two to Web three is increasing. Why? Because all the telecom companies they do KYC and AML of every user, which is the biggest friction point in crypto today. When they do that, automatically the Web two to Web three users who are coming in, they are unknowingly doing transactions within Web three without realizing that they are in Web three, and that makes it easy because as you grow. Education is costly, but as they learn on their own, education becomes a lot easier, and that's how you move more people from Web two to Web three. And the size of the market of telcos today we are talking about what one we're going to go to seven. We're going to be I can I can write it down right now that we're going to be close to two hundred million registered users by the end of December twenty twenty four with at least seven telcos integrated into our ecosystem in next year. We're going to move on further and further. Maybe uh, double, big, maybe triple. How big is your team, man? You you didn't. I don't. I don't think I've heard you answer this question. How big is your team, and did you receive any funding? So we are an eighty-four member team with fifty-seven on the technical side, and roughly twenty-seven odd on the business side. Um, we've raised. So we are split as an entity. So we have an equity entity and a crypto entity. Uh, which is the foundation on the equity entity? We've kind of raised around eight million US dollars, but since January twenty twenty three, we've been EBITDA as well as cash flow positive. Uh, we're doing close to a million dollars. So roughly, uh, let me put it this way: December twenty twenty three, we closed the books at eleven uh, million US. We had an EBITDA of five point six, five point seven, and we had a PAT of around. Four point, four point three, four point four. So that was a pat. We had that cash plus investor money, which was I think three or four million, which sitting in the bank. So that's been the case study on the equity side because of our profitability, and on the other and our burn is two hundred k, and we are doing close to a million, million and a half a month in terms of uh, revenue. Then coming on the crypto side, on the crypto side, um, our major cost is mainly. Couple of our devs because of the L2 and stuff that we are building. Uh, so the revenues now, since we've got listed, are paramount. Of course, it's going to be a long time journey, as everybody knows. I mean, at the end of the day, we're listed, right? Because we are listed, it's a long trajectory. So there's massive revenue expected by the towards the end of 2024 to on the crypto side, uh, but our burn is very small. So from that perspective, I would say eight million on the equity side, and five million, including pre-sale, IDOs, private rounds on the token side. That's the fundraise.
Got you, man. Got you. Oh, Zillion is joining after the battle, man. Hey, how are you, man? I'm good. I'm very good. Well, very well. Good, good, we, good. We were waiting for you. But, oh, Justin, Justin, I just saw this on Twitter. But uh, CZ was sentenced to four months, uh, four months in uh, in prison. Was yeah, that's what I was following, actually. That's, that's why. I was... Yeah, I un understandable, my friend. I wanted to follow this trial as well. It was between zero and 36 months. Just a little uh, tension here. Going back to you, TBH. Um, where By the you... way, uh, if I could just jump in really quick there. Of course. Yeah, what a weird day. Uh, not only is CZ being sentenced now to a possibly actual jail time, uh, it sounds like the four months probably, but also Roger Ver. Uh, is being charged with tax evasion now, uh, which is kind of ironic that he left the United States. He renounced his citizenship and lived in Japan for a while. I heard uh, through some friends, I, I know him, I've worked on some stuff he's worked on, but uh, that he was coming back to the U.S.? <laughs> Did he come back to the U.S. and now they're charging him with tax evasion? Is that what's Oops. happening? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let's end up this segment. We have three minutes left, but... Uh, I want to keep this short and sweet. TBH, where can we follow your progress? And uh, if we, if for the audience listening, where can we learn more about what you're building, uh, etc.? Twitter, Discord, Telegram, you go for it. I mean, all of those, all of the above. So Twitter, Telegram, Discord, plus our website, thebinaryholdings.com, our token website, binary token, so which is B-N-R-Y token.com. Uh, plus, you can look us up on Mexi, MEXC. We are trading. We've been uh, we've been trading very well. We opened up at seven and a half cents. We've been at around thirty. We've been trading between thirteen and fifteen cents. That's pretty solid. And the current market, as we see, everyone's like in the dumps, pretty much. So from that perspective, we are doing well. So please follow us on Mexi as well. Um, support us, I would really appreciate because we are getting a lot of telcos in the space. The numbers are going to grow. Web2 users are going to come into Web3. And by us also partnering with a lot of Web3 and Web2 companies, we are truly becoming a bridge for a unilateral bridge, right? Where A dual bridge where Web2 can connect with Web3 and Web3 can connect with Web2. So support us, um, Mexi, Twitter, Discord, Telegram and our website. So thank you so much. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Hey, let's, let's also connect. Uh, I'll DM you and we can uh, talk about how you said you're going to Optimism, the OP stack, which is, yeah. uh, I, I like Optimism, but there may be some ways to use also uh, Polygon has built the Ag layer, which connects all L2s. So there may be a w actually a way you can use Optimism as your base stack with Polygon Ag layer to connect you to all the L2s seamlessly as well with composability done i look forward to your dm and let's uh, chat after that cool and if you need sure. analytical tools on your network we're here my friend bubble maths so please Super. feel free to thank dm so us much. as well thank <laughs> you connections being made here here we go networking <laughs> in real time man let's go sure. all right every everybody that was lovely thank you for connecting to this show I hope you learned a couple of things here and there. I hope we managed to distill some knowledge, uh, or at least it was entertaining. So thank you for tuning in and see you on the next one.